What's up, champs? Welcome back to another episode of the Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Burnett. Joining me, as always, my pal and yours, Louis Ezekiel. Louis, my friend, how are you doing this fine, fine Thursday Eve? Man, I feel like we are just desperately trying to keep up with everything that's going on. It has been wild. Uh, there have been calls for hourly short shifts. It's it's a lot. We gotta we gotta just be as nimble as we can here. There's a lot to cover with all of this craziness going on. That is very very true. I think we the other day were like, well, hopefully we just don't. The show doesn't turn into just reading off a list of uh, COVID headlines. But that's where we're gonna start tonight. I'm about to read off a list of COVID headlines because essentially. COVID continued to dominate headlines in all of the big sports this week. We're seeing its impact across the globe, um, and the NHL is feeling it as well. Uh, frankly, I'm kind of just at a point where it's like I, I feel like I'm in just in survival mode of getting through my weeks and, and just making sure that my lineup is as filled as possible. And like you said last week, making my moves as close to puck drop as I can. Um, you know, we're even seeing though players like Tucker Pullman and Morgan Frost get pulled mid game for positive tests, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem to bode well for those teams. Uh, Pullman later tested negative and seems like he'll be back next game. Uh, we've seen Calgary's fourth game of the week get canceled, and now they have up to 30 members of the organization in the COVID protocol, including Johnny Gaudreau, Jacob Markstrom, Daryl Sutter. Uh, the Preds are now up to six players and their entire coaching staff in protocol, though their game tonight is still on. Good news for the Hurricanes, who had their game Tuesday against Minnesota postponed, but they had no new positive tests today for a second straight day, so they're in the middle of a game tonight. Uh, in Florida, Aaron Ekblad and Frank Vitrano missed morning skate. They were later announced to be on the COVID protocol. The Panthers made a boatload of call-ups for tonight's game, uh, definitely expecting a Mackenzie Weger you know, maybe 40, 45 Seth Jones-esque uh, minutes tonight. We also saw three positives in Arizona, including Lawson Krause. They play Anaheim tomorrow, Friday night. So that's worth keeping in mind. And if there's a cancellation there, you should be dropping your streamer level Ducks players as they do not play again this week. If you happen to somehow have ads left this week after the just the, the players have dropped like flies. With that said, I think it's time to look at some of the fantasy fallout from all of this COVID news around the league. Hopefully, we'll have some time to get to some streaks later. But, Lewis, I'll defer over to you. Where do you want to start us off in the COVID fallout on Thursday night? Yeah, you mentioned the Predators game being on. And actually, the reason it is on is because the Avalanche players voted to play after they found out that Darcy Kemper and Kale McCarr would be entering COVID protocol. Uh, so they knew that they would be short those two players. They elected to play anyway. Uh, that is a game just with, you know, massive COVID attrition at this point. Uh, keep an eye out on those two, of course. Uh, could mean a better opportunity for two players that we talked about previously, Sam Gerrard and Eric Johnson, uh, with Devon Taves also out on the defensive side for the Avs. Uh, and of course, it means that Pavel Fransos is going to get his first start in more than a year, uh, and he is uh, actively in that game right now. Uh, so finally, those who held on to him, if you were paying close enough attention uh, when it came up to puck drop, you would have gotten a game from Fransos, or else a number of people rushed out to go and grab them. I believe Elon grabbed him in Cupful Tier 1. And honestly, Lewis, you talk about a couple of defensemen that we mentioned on Tuesday's show. I would be all over Sam Gerrard if he's available in any leagues. Uh, that is a massive opportunity for him with both of the players who are playing ahead of him on the top power play so far this year out of the out of action. And if they're both COVID positive, you're getting basically two full weeks of power play one Sam Gerrard. So go out and get him. Uh, same possibility for Francois here. There, there's a lot of opportunity here. Yeah, and two other players of note that we should point out are missing on COVID protocol for the Avs. Andre Burakovsky and JT Comfer also are out. Uh, it was briefly mentioned by Peter Baugh that Kadri was the one who was out, but he quickly corrected. So some, you know, just you got to be very, very active uh, trying to figure out where all these things are happening at any given time. It, You know, the news is coming fast and sometimes even the people reporting it can't quite keep up. 
Heading to Boston next, where Patrice Bergeron joined Brad Marchand on the COVID protocol, along with Jeremy Swayman and a few other players. Uh, David Pasternak, the lone remaining member of their usual line one, is now playing with Taylor Hall and Charlie Coyle on that top unit. We did get a question about Pasternak on the patron-only Discord group. Uh, players, I guess fantasy managers are, are nervous to see 21 points through 25 games for Pasta, a 69 point pace, which would be his lowest since 0506. Sorry, that should be 1516, which was his second year in the league. He is averaging, though, 4.3 shots per game played, highest of his career, and shooting just 7%, which is the lowest of his career. Probably we would expect him to be closer to about double that, about 14% at the end of the year and he's seeing the highest ice time of his career probably in part because the Bruins are having to lean on him due to injuries and and now COVID issues if you look a bit deeper on Pasternak he has a career low in on ice five on five shooting percentage point participation at even strength and on the power play and the lowest secondary assist rate of his career I think putting all that together this is a pretty clear buy low opportunity It could be risky, too, but it might be worth waiting a few games with those line mates out. We've seen him play with line two line mates before, but that's when the other two members of the perfection line were eating up the tough minutes. So it's possible that if you can't get a buy low on pasta tonight, maybe it's worth waiting a game or two. You're playing chicken, certainly, in case he does start to go off, and then the the owner is certainly going to be too scared to to get rid of him if he starts to look hot again. But definitely worth keeping your eye on the pasta prize. Yeah, I think that's a really good point on that buy low opportunity. You know, this is a guy that we know can really produce, uh, and and like you pointed out, that shooting percent I think is is bound to improve, and especially with as much as he's firing at the net. All right, another spot where we have uh, seen some interesting developments, and this is not in the recent wave of COVID exits, but uh, in Jordan Bennington's absence, we have seen Charlie Lindgren put together three straight quality starts, uh, allowing two one and one goals against versus Detroit, Montreal, and Dallas. And with Bennington sounding like he is not quite ready to return, Lindgren is likely to get Friday's start in a rematch against Dallas, although they will have some enforcements. Uh, It seems likely that Rope Hintz will return. The Discord is in a big debate about what comes next for St. Louis in goal. Uh, You know, Bennington has been quite uneven after a great start. He has only just recorded one quality start in his last seven opportunities. Do you think there's any chance that Lindgren comes in and steals starts? I'm a little skeptical just because I feel like he is, you know, third in the goalie hierarchy um, when Vili Huso is healthy. Um, you know, I, I feel like this might just be kind of a hot streak that could evaporate at any time. And it seems like they would be much more interested in giving the number one and two goalies uh, a better opportunity. Do you think there's any chance that Lindgren gets in uh, for more games after Bennington's return? No, not really. I mean, maybe if we see... Uh, like Bennington comes back and has a really bad night, they might go back to Lindgren. I, I, like, I wouldn't drop him instantly just as long as Huso remains out. But I, I would expect that when Bennington and Huso are back, Lindgren gets reduced back to a, a, a non-existent role. Yeah, that's my thinking as well, unfortunately. It's really nice to see him come out and play well, but uh, I would be taking it and running while you can, but be ready to jettison him once Bennington puts up, you know, or gets a couple starts in a row. Uh, Another goalie issue uh, is in Florida. You know, we talked about some Florida players who are missing because they were in COVID protocol, uh, including Bennett and Ekblad. Um, But another player who is absent from that team today, not because of COVID, but because he was sent down to the AHL, is Spencer Knight. You have to go back six games to find Spencer's last quality start. A huge win, it was, uh, stopping 45 of 46 versus the Devils. But since then, his best start has been 885. Uh, and the badness was really highlighted by an eight goal against ham blasting at the hands of the Senators. Um, you know, I think in part he was sent down in order to make room for more bodies in the lineup for a team that really needs them. Um, but, you know, do you look at night now as a must drop in one year leagues and any non dynasty keepers? That's sort of, that's sort of where I'm feeling he is at this point. Yeah. I mean, mainly I think they're, they're probably sending him down so that they can fill roster spots with warm bodies because he's able to be sent down for free but ultimately i don't think that you should be holding him and i wouldn't have been holding him beyond this beyond the last like 
few weeks after he sort of fumbled the bag when he was given a shot uh, as the starter when Bobrovsky was out for a few games. So I'm I'm over Spencer Knight in one year leagues definitely. All right, well, let's head over to Washington, where we had uh, a player that we talked about on our last episode hit the COVID protocol just as soon as we were done talking him up. Yeah, Evgeny Kuznetsov goes on COVID last, I guess, yesterday, and we had been talking about Nicholas Backstrom and whether he was a threat to Kuznetsov's top on spot on the top line. Backstrom doesn't get that spot in Kuzi's absence, though. Instead, he goes to line two. And Lars Eller pops up to the top line. He now has three goals in three games and five points in his last four. Eller was a guy I really liked to go to as a streamer last season, as he'd often wind up on power play one when the when the Caps would run into injury problems. He's not getting that opportunity now, but he is playing with Ovi and on a bit of a heater. It's a fun stream. That's where I'm at with Eller. Yeah, I think so, too. A good opportunity, you know, not uh, widely rostered. Uh, so a good chance there. Just one more really quick one. Uh, Drew Doughty is in pr- uh, COVID protocol, which means Sean Dersey is back on power play one. Uh, that's really the main impact there. Um, and if you're looking for, uh, you know, uh, somebody to fill in on defense, Sean Dersey has had some nice production. I believe he has an assist here on Thursday night as well. Uh, so somebody to keep an eye on, certainly to fill one of those gaping holes that probably exist in your lineup. All right, Lewis, we're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll have a few streaks to get into. You're listening to Short Shifts. Well, Lewis, the temperatures outside have been dropping just as much as players have been hitting the COVID protocol in the NHL. And I do think that looking forward, I I do think we'll be able to travel. I do think we'll be able to get back into NHL stadiums later this season. And when we do, when you're looking ahead, I need you to check out TickPick. That's T-I-C-K-P-I-C-K. There's no need to exhaust yourself searching all over the internet for tickets to see your favorite hockey team play. TickPick is the original no-fee ticket site and the only one you'll ever need as your go-to for all tickets for NHL hockey, concerts, NFL, NBA, and more. We're now getting into a point in the season where you can start to see the playoff race shaking out and a team that I would love to go see this year and a team who I'm very excited to see in the playoff race into December, my New York Rangers. I would love to be able to get down to New York for a game. I went on to TickPick. I was scoping out tickets and looking at games that I might be willing to go see a few months down the road here. Looking ahead into April and thinking about how nice it would be to go and see the Rangers and the Islanders in what could be a game that is deciding a playoff race. That's not something that we've seen in the last few years in Madison Square Garden. So when I do that, when I'm buying my tickets, I go straight to TickPick.com to get those seats. TickPick got rid of all those awful service fees that the other ticket sites charge, which allows them to guarantee the best prices on all of their NHL hockey tickets. Don't believe it? If you can find better prices for the same seats on another ticket website, TickPick will give you 110% of the difference in the purchase price. That's more than 100%. It's 10% more than 100%. You need to visit TickPick today at TickPick.com slash Carlson. That's T-I-C-K-P-I-C-K dot com slash Carlson. We are back for some more short shifts. And Lewis, I'm going to hand the ball on over to you to walk us through our first streak of the evening. All right, well, here's one that is near and dear to my heart as I have him on my team in Kakupful Tier 1, uh, and that's Jonathan Quick. Not a guy that many people pegged uh, for, you know, likely to have a successful season. You know, I we actually drafted uh, Cal Peterson, um, but handcuffed him with Quick early on in the season. I'm glad I did because Peterson was an easy drop. Uh, Cal Peterson's rocking a 310 goals against average and an 893 save percentage with only one quality start in his last five. Meanwhile, Jonathan Quick has started four in a row. He started eight of the last 11 games. And overall in the season, he is rocking a 2.01 goal against average and a .931 save percentage. That is not counting uh, this start he has against the shorthanded Panthers. I don't want to guess at how that's going to make things turn out. Certainly don't want to jinx things. Um, but, you know, he is now rostered on 54% of Yahoo leagues, but it really should be much higher. There are lots of teams that could use a goalie that is putting together 930 numbers. Uh, even if they are perhaps a bit unsustainable, you know, I would expect him to be down in the nine teens by the end of the season. But 
Uh, you know, really just a great start, a vintage Jonathan Quick season. He certainly seems to be in line to take two thirds of the starts moving forward, uh, until at the very least he would need to slip and Peterson would need to demonstrate some competence, uh, before anything is going to change. And even then, I think you rely on the guy who, you know, has given you so much uh, so far this season. I mean, you say vintage Jonathan Quick, but this might be his best season ever. He's got a, a career high save percentage through 17 starts, uh, a, almost a career low GAA. His goal saved above average is on pace to break his, his best season ever. Incredible numbers from Jonathan Quick. I tweeted about him the other day. Lewis, you know, at, at this point in the season, there are, we're usually starting to get answers for all of the questions that we have about breakouts and fall offs. I think the Jonathan Quick breakout is the one I understand the least. Truly, the only explanation I can think of is that goalies are cursed and we have no predictive abilities about their skills whatsoever. Yeah, expect the unexpected when it comes to your NHL goaltenders. But good on you, Johnny Quick. Love to see it. Well, Lewis, I'm going to go next. I need to give a bit of a mea culpa here because... On two episodes in a row, I nixed your boy, Kyle Lockposo. I said, stop trying to make Kyle Lockposo happen, Lewis. And at this point, when I look at the numbers, I look at the underlings, I look at the deployment. I'm not saying I'm adding him in any leagues, but I have to say I wouldn't dismiss him out of hand as a streamer on a week where the team has a decent schedule. And I, I just need to say that because I think that I was so forcefully against uh, Kyle Lockposo on air. I, I just need to take this mea culpa. The numbers look decent. He's got a 50 point pace or thereabouts after multiple 30 year se- or 30 point seasons. Uh, you look under the hood and the IPP is a touch high, but the numbers otherwise look fine. Two and a half shots per game is played. I just wanted to apologize for for being so anti Ocposo on our previous episodes. Yeah, he's uh, he's been pretty okay for us. So. Uh... Yeah, certainly someone that I would consider. Uh, I, I wish I was I was streaming him instead of Dylan Cousins, but I've been stuck with him uh, just because I'm trying to use all of my moves to to shore up all of my other hemorrhaging areas. But yeah, definitely an interesting one. A player who had been very reliable for us, but is starting to show some signs of regressing to the mean in a big way is Jared McCann over in Seattle. He's only got one goal and one assist in the last seven games. I like to see that he's still shooting a ton, and he's one of the few Kraken players who has considered consistently demonstrate a willingness to go to the dirty areas in the corners and in front of the net. He's got 25 shots in those seven games. So, you know, a touch under four shots a game, he's shooting plenty and is probably due for a little more scoring, uh, you know, from this recent streak. Uh, but really all it's done is serve to, to regress his earlier way too high shooting percentage back to the mean here. You know, it, all that regression seems to have kind of come at once. So it makes his slow pace right now stand out and make it look really bad in comparison to the torrid pace he had earlier in the season. Even still, he's maybe a smidge high. Um, but overall, you know, I think that it's, you know, it, it's a bit of an overcorrection. And I think he will start to even out a little bit here. Um, so, you know, if you've got someone who is just paying attention to the points, not looking at the shots, maybe this is someone that you can pick up uh, for kind of cheap. And I do want to say Dylan Cousins with an assist from Akposo uh, just came up across my screen. So, you know, a little a little in-game update there. And so we have one more streak for tonight's show. And honestly, I would feel bad, Lewis, if we didn't go to Ottawa, considering how hot they've been and how they keep on winning. I don't know what the score is on their game tonight, but they've been... A- uh, they've been truly turning heads, I would say, the last few weeks. And I think Brian and Elon have done a really good job talking about the Drake Batherson breakout and how he's ascended to become a 70 plus point guy. I want to talk about Josh Norris, a guy who, with 10 points in his last eight games, including a three point night against Florida in that 8 2 blowout you mentioned of Spencer Knight on Tuesday. And now Josh Norris is on pace for a very nice 69 points. Being on that top line, that top power play with Brady, TK, and Drake has him with 22 points in 26 games. And I'm starting to think that we might need to buy Josh Norris as also a 70-point player. It's first of all great to see him near three shots per game. And even though he's shooting nearly 20%, he's 177 shots into his career, and he's been a 17.5% shooter through those shots. So there is precedence to believe he could be a high percentage converter. The other on-ice underlines look pretty solid as well. 
And another thing that works in Norris's favor is he's a very close second in shots per 60 behind Brady on the power play, meaning that Norris is a volume shooter on the power play and at even strength. Brady's a volume shooter, but Norris is that high percentage converter that we like to see. He's shooting 17% on the power play. And, you know, you look at a 20% overall shooting percentage and you get a little nervous that, oh, it must be running up the clock on the power play or something like that. 17% on the power play, though, is it's pretty reasonable for a Josh Norris type. So while I think we'll see the even strength shooting percentage come down a bit, I think Norris does have the makings of a guy who shoots in that 16 plus percentage range. So I think things are looking pretty solid for Josh Norris, and I would put him up with Drake Batherson in that 70 point breakout club. Yeah, another thing that stands out for him is that he has pretty decent peripherals for a forward. Um, you know, obviously being center only, that does maybe limit your flexibility a little bit, but, you know, putting up, you know, I see games with four blocks. I see games with, you know, three hits and like some pretty consistent hits in there too. So especially if you're in a categories league or a roto league, he's giving you some very nice coverage. Um, you know, another player, uh, who's been really hot lately, who also has that sort of high shooting percentage is Chandler Stevenson. You know, I was looking into his numbers a bit and was surprised to see, you know, he's shooting 23% and that's probably too high, but he does have three other seasons of over 500 minutes played where he has shot, um, 17% or higher. You know, some of those were kind of low sample sizes, but he's another one of those guys, you know, who, uh, has kind of taken that step forward and shown that he can be, yeah, a high, a high percentage converter, like you called Norris. And that's all the time that we have for Short Shifts tonight. For myself, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And Lewis, I want to thank you for hanging out with me. I look forward to uh, getting back in the chair next week and chatting fantasy hockey with you again. Hopefully we don't see 60 new players join the COVID protocol between now and then. But I'm honestly, <laughs> I, I don't feel that optimistic. Yeah, you know, I don't think this is what Brian and Elon meant when they said they were excited to bring us on to cover the news that happens between the mega shows. Uh, I didn't think they were considering us, you know, zamboning up all of the, the COVID madness. But uh, here we are. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Please give us a follow on Twitter at ShortShiftsKK. Brian and Elon can be found at Keeping Carlson. Dave Benton of the Stream Scheme is at NHL Stream Scheme. I also recommend you follow the suite of Game Day uh, accounts at Game Day Lines, at Game Day Goalies, and at Game Day News. Now, more than ever, those accounts are so critical. I just have push notifications turned on for all of them because they are providing hugely important stuff all day long. Uh, please visit the great sites where we research our episodes at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, Natural stat trick and cupful.com our intro and outro music was created by pat roach and even though it seems like they took away that assist from kyle akpo so i still want to make sure that until we see you next time that you will play smart and keep your shifts short 